All right, all right, all right, all right. Hello, everybody. Just getting streaming. The Gaz Williams Show is back. Yes, it's been off air for, gosh, three weeks now, is it maybe? Something like that. Anyway, uh, I'm just going to make sure everything's working and then we'll get stuck into tonight's show. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, yeah, so just checking out, making sure that we are actually working and that people can see things. So any chatties uh, in the live stream, say hello. And uh, apologies for those of you who are tuning in after the live show. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Gaz Williams, by the way. I'm sure you might have gathered that by now. Uh, and this is indeed my show. And um, hopefully I'm going to be doing most Wednesdays going forward. I know I've got a bunch of rehearsals and gigs and various things coming up that might affect that. Um, uh, hey, Matt, I've just been watching Matt Hodson's uh, show over maths. Um, really cool. He's uh, a bit of a guru of all things modular. Make sure you check him out. Uh, we were on Sonic Talk earlier, the both of us earlier on the the classic Sonic Talk podcast. Um, <laughs> Matt being a regular now, he's sort of uh, he was the new boy. He's not so much the new boy anymore. <laughs> ah, okay, so we're just picking up uh, a few live viewers, and then we'll get stuck in. Uh, as I say, I've been um, I've been taking a bit of a break, and uh, but now I'm back. <laughs> And yes, in front of me is the UDO Super 6. We've got a couple of views of it there and there. Okay. Uh, I have a story to tell as well. So it's something that I'm, yeah, I'm kind of really looking forward to uh, telling you really because I've had a little part, a very small part. I'm not going to over, <laughs> over egg my part in this, but I have a very small part in the journey of the Super 6. Um, so I'll tell you that in a moment. Um, but yeah, how oh, hello. Yeah, hello everybody in chat room. Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining me. Great, and really nice to see a lot of the old regulars back, yes. And uh, yes, apologize for taking a little bit of time out, but I needed to for various reasons. And I have got a lot of work on, which is cool, but is also meaning that it's a little bit harder to do regular shows. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is tonight's show about the UDO Super 6. And um, what a marvellous instrument it is. It really is. Um, yes, so. UDO. Now, this synthesizer is made in the city of Bristol. It's also the city that I happen to live in as well. So, you know, maybe that's one reason. I'm calling this show, Why Did I Buy It? Because I've got plenty of subtractive synthesizers. In, in fact, one that's not a million miles away from the Super 6 in the Behringer Deep Mind 12. Uh, although I've got just the, the desktop version of that. Um <laughs> Dai Stanton, just the thing after a, a, I can't say that word anymore, uh, a, a pooey day, shall we say. <laughs> uh, yes, the manual. Right, let's get stuck in now. Okay, thank you very much for if you've hung in there so far, I am going to get stuck in. Okay, so the UDO Super 6 is, a, I'm sure most of you will know, so I won't go into it too much, uh, but I'd like to tell you the story of my involvement with it, though. Uh, but it is a 12-voice polyphonic binaural analog hybrid synthesizer with super wave technology now i'm going to i'm going to explain what each of those over the jargony bits actually means um throughout tonight because i'm going to explain some of the key features that makes this synthesizer quite unique um but anyway but let me just tell you about my little involvement with it first um now, this dates back around about 10 years where I was first introduced to George Hearn. George Hearn is the creator of the Super 6. And uh, he'd made a synthesizer just as a kind of project, really. And a friend, and he'd lent it to a friend of mine called Chris Powell. Chris had it in his studio and I'd gone over to see Chris and Chris said, hey, look at this. So I had a little play around with it. And I thought, wow, this is cool. This is an analog poly uh, from the era that no one was making analog polys. 
and um, Chris said, hey, you should meet George. George is a very interesting chap. I said, I'd love to meet him. So uh, so I met George and uh, I just started doing stuff on Sonic State around then. So um, I felt like really excited to sort of meet him and to say, hey, look, you know, I, I'm on this show on Sonic State regularly and, I, you know, I'd love to talk more and get to know what you're up to. And, uh, yeah, this was ages ago. And... Um, but George had said, oh, well, I've just made, you know, I made this synthesizer almost as a, a kind of hobby. He'd started his Hearn Morley business at the time, making kind of high end electronic components and uh, and the like. Um, but I don't think he had a particular mind to bring that to market. I think it was more of just this kind of mission that he was on. Anyway, fast forward a few years and... Uh, and there was kind of mutterings of the return of analog polysynths. And uh, I thought, ooh, this is interesting. Uh, I wonder what George is up to. So I contacted George out of the blue and said, hi, George, remember me? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I remember you. Uh, I said, you know, I was just curious what, as to what you were up to. He said, well, I've been developing stuff, but, um, you know, and you're welcome to come to the lab and have a look at what I've been up to. But, uh, you know, I'm not really sure that there's a market for what I'm doing. So I went over there and there wasn't like a kind of physical synth as such. It was all breadboards and circuit boards and whatever. And um, but George was talking to me about some of the ideas he was having. But he said, ultimately, I think it's just going to be too expensive to actually make this thing. And I was a little bit like, oh, you know, you'd be surprised. There's this emerging market who is maybe prepared to pay more for synths. Because I think he was talking about, oh, gosh, it would probably end up being around three and a half thousand pounds or something, which seemed like kind of uh, way out compared to what everything else was at the time. But I was like really trying to encourage him and say, no, no, you'd be surprised. This is good. Anyway, I'm not taking too much credit for, for this, but he then, you know, he, le he told me that he was really pleased that I'd given him this encouragement and he'd sort of, uh, he'd gone back and carried on developing this thing. So much so it got to the point where he needed to uh, put it into some sort of encase, you know, some case to, you know, encase the whole thing. And uh, uh, I brought in my good friend and drummer in Asteroid Deluxe from a band, a uh, space rock band I play in, um, James Phillips, who did all the woodwork for this kind of synth now this synth as it goes ended up then going over to modal and was the kind of proto prototype of mode of the modal 008 which was the george hearn modal collaboration uh, and that was that so it, it it came to market and that was amazing because you know i felt i you know i was like really pleased to see that so my relationship with george goes back there encompasses this anyway george it, it didn't quite work out exactly everything to plan with modal won't go into any of that i don't actually know too much about that but it needless to say george wanted to head out on his own and and we've been in contact all through this period and he was telling me how you know he had a very specific idea it was a continuation of a lot of the ideas that he been pursuing he was in incredibly influenced by the roland synths of the early 80s as is apparent in the super six design but um you know he 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 was adamant about certain things you know he didn't want it to have any kind of screen any sort of display because he you know anything that is an abstract layer from the player and from reaching out and touching controls you know it, the controls immediately respond to what you do you don't have to sweep through and pick up the control which i know some people might want but it he, you know he he was really adamant that everything just instantly reacts to what you do and that everything is kind of laid out it's very similar to the Jupiter 6. Starsky Carr recently did a comparison with the Super 6 and the Jupiter 6. Uh, in that direct comparison, the Super 6 didn't kind of come out quite as good as it should have. And I think in part that was because they were mono comparisons and the Super 6 is kind of super strength lies in its kind of stereo. Um, however, I would go over and see George during the development of the Super 6 and for a very long time there was no synthesizer at all it was again just like breadboard he had a little oxygen 25 midi keyboard that he was using and he spent an incredible amount of time just on trying to get the oscillator to sound as lovely as it could and to uh, you know and he was 
you know, I, I was kind of thinking, come on, hurry up there, George. But uh, no, he was adamant that he wanted to get the fundamental part of this right. And I was like, OK, this is really impressive. And, um, you know, uh, I took my Medusa uh, over one time. Um, now, the Medusa, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the, the Polyend Dreadbox collaboration, very interesting synth, but it's actually quite easy to make it sound not that nice <laughs> you know and you do have to kind of work it to make it sound great uh i mean and it can sound fantastic but in a direct comparison to this very basic thing george was working on there wasn't well the super six just had a much more beautiful kind of raw tone um and uh so i was like okay this is this is very promising um you know george was telling me about the plan then about the, the kind of the plan to be a binaural synth and this is something we will talk about quite a bit over the course of this little investigation but um but yes this process went on you know, for, you know i was surprised it took quite a while for him to develop this uh but he really committed everything you know he sold his business his existing business to to you know put everything into setting up UDO and to get the Super 6 out. And um, one time he was excited, he, you know, they'd had the um, drawings, prototype drawings. So we went over, I went over and was having a look through them and uh, looking at the original kind of colour schemes that they were originally looking at. And they were so sort of maybe a little bit more of an aquamarine kind of colour, which I was really keen on, but I think... Um, may have been a little bit too a little bit too far out <laughs> um but it was really great seeing those but then he dropped the bombshell which was he said that he's gonna get axel hartman to do the you know to finalize the design and i was just then that is a fantastic idea axel hartman is the beatles of synth design as i like to call him he has had so many hits in terms of making wonderful synths pretty much most of the most of the best-selling professional synths released in the 20 in the last 20 years he's been he's had a hand in the design of you know quite significantly in a lot of the cases uh so i thought that is a very smart move uh bringing axel in and um yes so axel was brought in and then yes and then the Super 6 started to emerge and it was shown first time properly at Superbooth 2019 and it created a real... Uh, it was one of the hits of that show. It absolutely was. Everybody who was getting to try it out, especially hearing all the kind of binaural quality of it, was blown away. It was, it was fantastic. And it was, for me, it was like a thrill because, you know, seeing this thing through all of the development of it becoming you know, being presented to the public for the first time. Um, yeah, so I was, yeah, I mean, my involvement in it is really small. In most, in the most, I've just been an encourager, really. I've just been encouraging George all along. And, uh, you know, so when George, um, me and George were having a, a chat on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and um, I'm talking about all sorts of things, you know, and... Um, at the end of the call, at the end of the conversation, I was going, so um, can I buy one off you then? <laughs> and he was really surprised, but he, it was great. And they pretty much um, managed to assemble one for me the next day, which was amazing. Because I, I think this run now, they've done really well. And I think they're pretty much, um, I think the next batch are going to go into production soon. I'm not sure. You'd have to get in touch with the UDO, but this synth is going to be around for quite some time. And uh, actually, one of the things George said when I said I wanted to buy one, he said, do you know what? That's that's a very good value for money decision. And uh, he said that because of the field gate programmable array architecture of the Super 6 or the FGPA, um, I think I said that right, <laughs> One of the things that really does make this quite different is that that architecture that this running on, you know, it can be fundamentally changed. And George says, I'm going to like dedicate the rest of my life to making this synth uh, as good as it possibly can be. And I was going, OK, all right. I like that. This is, uh, you know, and I believe him. I believe that his intentions to keep improving this will uh, will, oh, will definitely continue and to 
continue to provide, well, great things. Now, I'm kicking myself because I forgot to do something I was going to do today. Um, Udio have just released their first official patch bank of 64 patches for this. Now, it would have been a really good idea to have loaded those in tonight. Uh, however, that's not entirely what I wanted to do because I wanted to go really from the basics of this. And I'll shut up soon and we'll start listening. But um, yeah, so I just want to just finish my little story there. And um, so anyway, I went, I had a session in Cardiff the next day and I managed to go and collect uh, the Super 6 before I went. And, um, oh, sorry, that was the day after. I brought this, I brought it home. I was going to, I took it to a session the, ne the next day. So it was the, immediately as I had it, it was put into use. Um, but I brought it back and I put it on the kitchen table and uh, for various reasons, I couldn't play with it straight away. And I was dying to. Anyway, once I got a little bit of time, I sat in front of it. And I thought I opened the manual up and I was... We were talking about manuals on Sonic State today, but I opened the manual up and yeah, sorry, this is utterly, utterly showing off now, but in the acknowledgements, okay, I don't know if you can see that, but yes, Nick Bat and myself and my mate, Mike Hagerman, who's actually involved with Super, uh, with Udio now. In the acknowledgements, in the manual, I felt really good about that. I, you know, that was such a, such a lovely, such a lovely treat to see that, um, to be acknowledged. <laughs> I was really pleased, you know, so that, that's my, that's my little involvement with it really. And it is a slight, you know, it's a very slight in involvement. So I really don't want to kind of, um, <laughs> exaggerate that, um, the audio engineer, does it make a sound if you play it? Yes, it does. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you for listening to my little tale there. But yes, that's my kind of background with this. And, you know, it was another thing as well. I had been considering uh, a kind of a large poly for my studio. I've got lots and lots of synths here. Um, I've got a few polys. I've got the Dreadbox Abyss and I've got the DeepMind 12. Um, both of those are modules, so... You kind of need a keyboard with them. And I'd been really umming and ahhing about getting a hydrosynth. I'd still kind of like one, but uh, the toss-up really was between a hydrosynth, a, a polybrute from Arturia, and the, the Super 6. Now, when you look at a feature list comparison, the Super 6 really doesn't compare as well to those. It's, it's quite a simple synth, maybe, in, in some respects. But... What the Super 6 does, it kind of connects with the story I was saying that George has spent such a lot of time just trying to get the fundamental things right. Is George has tried to make, essentially, an update to those classic 80s Roland synths, um, taking advantage of some of the modern technologies available. But ultimately, it's more of an iterative kind of improvement on, say, a Jupiter 6 or, um, or a Ju you know, Juno 106 or Juno 60 or... Uh, yeah, I think the Juno, uh, sorry, the Jupiter 6 has a very similar layout. Um, but, uh, oh, now Dbridge is saying he has both. The Hydra synth, but the Super 6 is by far superior sounding machine. Interesting. Thank you for that. <laughs> right. Ah, and also Ben Bresley is saying about nicer blue. Yes. So here, here's a little thing now. The Super 6 then. It ships in two colours. It ships in like a dark grey and it ships in the blue. Uh, just a little straw poll of the live viewers. Um, what is your favourite? Because I realised behind me, all my things really are in dark greys. And uh, well, I got the white, that one white. But I have, this is where, this is where the Super 6 lives in a in prime position here in my little room. Um, and... You know, all the other devices, pretty much, it would have kind of, like, fitted in if I'd have gone with the kind of the dark grey look. But the blue was just too too cheerful, really, and too special, I think, to ignore. So um, Robbie Bronneman, my good mate Robbie Bronneman, he went for the darker grey one. And uh, initially I had that little twinge of buyer's, you know, regret about the colour scheme. But now 
I've not. Now I'm sold on the blue. I do love the blue. And it is a, it is a, it's a very specific shade of blue. And I know how much kind of uh, agonising went into the colour scheme. So um, <laughs> Cresshead's looking at a purple TB3 right now. <laughs> uh, Deebridge went for the grey as he knew everyone would go for the blue. Interesting. I've no idea which one really will be the... Uh, will be the most popular. I wonder if George will ever tell me that. <laughs> um, okay, but anyway, yeah. So I think really I, enough of the waffle, let's get stuck in because this synth has got, uh, has got a lot of interesting stuff. Now I'm sure a lot of you will have seen lots about this already. Nick Bat's done a fantastic review of this and um, Cuckoo recently has got one, which is nice. Cuckoo's got that delightful kind of musicality and it was really nice hearing him him uh, playing with this. Um, yeah, okay. So, as mentioned on Sonic earlier, on Sonic Talk earlier, something which I think is a really, really important thing with a synthesizer is to be able to, uh, to get an initial sound straight away. We do have a manual button here. Let's have a little look at what we're going here. Um... And if I press the manual button, then... <laughs> oh, I've only got one, one channel coming out. Hang on. Let's just... Oh, there we go. That's a what you see is what you get. But if you press shift and then manual, then it puts it in to its kind of default sound. Which is this. Let's get my levels up a little bit. Which is our... Little sawtooth. Okay, so that being able to get to that sound very quickly for me is like a kind of crucial thing. And every single session that I've done with this has involved me going to that initial sound as a way to uh, just, just to start the little voyage. And I think I might just do something like that now. I'll just build up a patch straight away from this and we'll see where we go with it okay uh, i'll talk i'll talk through what's going on as well but um yeah so it is a, a st essentially like a two oscillator synth dds1 and dds2 but mm, you know i'll just stay with dds1 for the moment we've got similar to the jupiter uh the mixer being just a single kind of blend between DDS1 and DDS2. So I'm going to pan that over anyway to DDS1 uh, and then flick through some of the waves that we've got. Sine, triangle, square. Oh, sorry. I, no. <laughs> Sawtooth, square, triangle, noise, and then wa waveform. Now, you've got a bunch of waveforms. Not wavetables, just single sample waveforms. If you press them twice, you've got a, an alternative as well. So you've got, uh, what have we got there? 32 single sample waveforms. Okay. Um, very simple stuff, in a way. Uh, however, what we can do is... Super wave technology is this kind of like a kind of super saw type thing, but it works on all of the waveforms. And we initiate it with the super DDS here. You can put it to set it to half or on, fully on. So what this is doing is it's creating six other wave wave uh, wave um, waveforms, which are um, which are then. You can sort of detune further away with the detune control here. And you can modulate how much that is being kind of detuned. We've got a little switch here to say it's being detuned by LFO1. Or envelope one. Or both. And... Um, that well let's just have a look so if i do that with the different waveforms so this is using the uh sawtooth see that's the sine wave so it's like a super sine wave and then there's the square wave Try 
triangle. Yeah, and as you increase the detune, yeah, it sort of uh, it makes the voices uh, three to the left and three to the right of the um, of the core oscillator sort of spreads them out, the pitch of them out. So that's what they mean by superwave technology, that you can have these, you know, multi-wave. It's, it's probably easier just to do this with Sawtooth for now, though. So it has got that kind of super saw vibe. Going to just tweak it a moment. So, like, no effects, nothing. We'll come to that in a moment, but. So, sort of like, really simple. You know, I've done virtually nothing, and, and the sound is just lovely. Hey, Noir at Flank V. Good to see you, Steve. And thank you very much. Wow, how cool. Nice. So, like, it's amazing. And, and all I've done there is just enable that, that super wave, you know, and yeah, just have a little bit of modulation and you've got a sound straight away. Again, this is just using just only the oscillator one and it's a... Now, I was mentioning before... Oh, let's get me out of the way. It says here, 12 voice, polyphonic, binaural, analog hybrid synthesizer with superwave technology. So cross off, we've done the superwave technology. Uh, a hybrid synthesizer, analog hybrid synthesizer. This has got, yes, it has, got, each voice does go through an independent analog filter and analog amplitude, so the VCA. Uh, so that is the analog hybrid because our oscillators are generated digitally with the uh, FGPA kind of core, as mentioned. Um, and oh, that's not so interesting. Let's go here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I've got binaural. Yes. So that's the other part of the uh, of this rather complex s description. Now, some people have kind of got a bit confused. Why don't they just call it stereo? I think the use of binaural, I think, is is actually very is is actually does make a lot of sense rather. Um, so it says 12 voice, but why is it called Super 6? Well, it's called Super 6 because each of our six, each of our six note polyphony, each voice, you have two, you have like essentially two synthesizer voices hardwired in the left and in the right channel, really. Um, and where it becomes kind of interesting then is when you start to decouple them from each other. So initially they move completely in sync or <laughs> whatever the whatever the wave is and we've got a control over here which is called the lr phase the left right phase and that's being and so lfo1 will affect those two identical synth voices it'll introduce a phase offset between them that results in a fantastic stereo kind of sound so Let's bring that up, slow it down a little bit. You're going to have to listen to this in stereo for it to make sense. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah, I mean, taking it away. Do you know, I think it might be easier to hear that if I take off the super, this, this super wave technology. There we go. I'm playing 
multiple notes. And, and we're hearing both of them doing exactly the same thing. However, as soon as we start to, to change the phase relationship, sound in mono. <laughs> Just checking <laughs> that we are indeed hearing this in mono. Actually, I can tell if I take off binaural. Oh no, that's great, yeah. So interestingly, you see, if I disable binaural here, then what you will hear is, as I cycle a note, left channel, right channel, left channel, right channel, left channel, right channel, so each voice is playing, and this kind of uh, hardwired. There's currently no way to move those voices, so if, I don't know if they are, you know, if that is something impossible. But um, when I do disable binaural, though, it does become a full twelve voice uh, polyphonic synth. Um, I'm just going to go to a patch, actually, uh, one of the patches in Bank 1. I think it's around here. Is something under? No, I think it might be here. And it's like a, it's like quite a nice electric piano. <laughs> This is not using the binaural. Uh, this is just so it's kind of let's hold some notes down. that sounds is either is going to alternate between the left and the right yeah so yeah so it is potentially a 12 note a 12 voice polyphonic synth with that caveat that the voices will alternate uh, if you want them to be mono then you have to just pull out uh, the right channel and then it'll just sum into mono then that's the only way to make it a 12 voice uh, polyphonic synth. Um, yeah, <laughs> if you don't want that kind of left and right, um, the left and right kind of thing going on. Uh, but you know, like this patch here, for instance, you can kind of see. So the velocity sensitivity is very simple on this. We've got off, which is like now, or we've got half, <laughs> or we've got on, which is full, full dynamics. Um, yeah, so it's sort of, um, in some ways, it is quite a limited synth in some ways, you know, and I think this is one of the beauties of it, though, is that you work within those limitations, and within those limitations is an absolutely gigantic range of sounds. Uh, I should just use a few presets just to do it a little bit justice. This bass in A4. It's just beautiful. Very simple. Ha! <laughs> Dice Sunderson said, 
it sounds very much in mole right now. I take that as a great compliment. I think he doesn't mean this, the thing I was doing before. Now, that's a really simple bass sound, but that is eminently useful in a recording studio. I'm in legato here, so you can hear. I could change that into solo. You know, so. What a rich, lovely bass it is, though. Really simple, but like pure and lovely. Similarly, just patch A1. It's quite like low volume. Is this? It's always patch. The first patch on a synth has to be impressive, and I think this one. Not sure who programmed it, but it's just a beautiful lyrical. So, so like some synths, you know, they aim to be, maybe the Hydra synth is a little bit like that, you know, you can get these patches that sound in, enormous and do loads of things, um, a little bit like Omnisphere in a way, you know, these super complex stuff, um, yet the you know and in a lot of times because i'm a working musician you know um i need from since more often than not simple straightforward kind of tones uh things that aren't massively um involved evolving and and the like uh so that's definitely one of the reasons why i i wanted to buy this one um I just think, I, I just, I, I find myself playing this patch just a lot. I find I play it a lot. So one of the things, one of the things that's kind of really special with this is that the, FGPA processor, it, it, it's working at a very, very high rate. I think 2.6 megahertz. So the sample, the internal sample rate is 2.6 megahertz. Now, that eliminates any possibility, any possibility whatsoever of aliasing. It does actually sound really nice in the top end. get some delay on. Yeah. It's just rich, it's satisfying and immediate you know uh i think it it just feels like a classic instrument you know and uh well one of the things i was talking to george about the other week was he was talking about how these synths are essentially the inspiration for this are like more or less 40 years old or getting on for 40 years old and they weren't really designed to last that long or they could i mean it's amazing that so many of them still ex still have survived um but the capacitors, all sorts of things, will wear out. They just, they just will. I mean, um, but George, through his um, previous business and, and through a lot of the work that he did, you know, um, he's a very experienced uh, electronic engineer, really. Um, so he's made sure that he specified just the very best components that he could find. And 
when you move these when you move these controls they feel like precision beautifully weighted fantastic uh controls uh that definitely are going to last for a very long time this is an instrument that is designed to be around for certainly 40 years and and more um Asio Head says those synths wouldn't be around if it wasn't for Kent. Kent Spong, that is. Kent Spong, the man with the greatest name of all time, is also Britain's preeminent synthesizer repairer, really. Um... Hopefully, Super Sixes won't need fixing for a while. Yes, that's true, Wagyu, hopefully. But yeah, fantastic build quality. It's got this beautiful full metal chassis. It's fantastic. There is one downside, however, and this is something that I should really just get out of the way. There's one thing that I'm not that keen on, and I, I've noticed that other people aren't so keen on it either, and that's this, you know, Roland-esque combined pitch and mod. The spring, when you push against there, is is really quite stiff. So... It's definitely something that I'd like to see them uh, improve. I think it could be better. Maybe retro. Maybe the spring is a bit too strong or something. Uh, oh, maybe it's getting a little looser as I'm getting used to it. Does it have aftertouch? Asks Algorithmart. Sorry if that's, <laughs> that's the right way. Yes, it does. However, it only has monophonic aftertouch. But fear not. MPE. There's a little MPE. Uh, um, mode on here currently we're waiting for the next firmware which is going to uh, open up a lot of the MIDI on here there is USB on the back here but currently that's only usable for um, archiving and loading in wave files into the you know um, the single cycle wave files and patch management and that sort of thing uh, but USB over MIDI is coming, and hopefully, I think this new update when it drops, it'll it'll uh, it'll have that working. Plus NRPN sort of controls, uh, and also MPE. So if you do have a Hydra synth with that that polyphonic keyboard, MIDI out and into the Super Six, and then you get all of that lovely Super Six loveliness with polyphonic aftertouch. And polyphonic aftertouch, I've been a huge fan of for years and years and years. Um, and I think this beautiful sound engine would just really benefit from it. Uh, I'm going to try it. I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to try it with my Medusa because the Medusa, although it's like a pad-based controls, um, that will actually act as a MPE polyphonic control surface as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that. And I think that could be quite fun. And I think even sequencing it from the, um, from the Medusa Maybe good. Now, mm. there is a sequence of an arpeggiator in here, um, which is good, but there's a few things I would like to see it do that it currently doesn't do. I mean, I think it's very much based on a, a Roland approach. Um, for instance, the arpeggiator, we have... Let's get like an arpy kind of sound. Oh, I've got external... I've got external clock on, I think. Let's just take that off. Come out here. Now, why is that not sync? Maybe. Uh, let's see, shift. I've just got to remember. In the most, there isn't much of this kind of stuff. There is a shift button, and the graphics on here do kind of tell you what the shift functions are. But in the external clock situation, if I hit external clock, shift, external clock, then these three buttons dictate um, the external clock. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, so slightly, slightly odd, but I think I'll get used to it. Um, okay. The all important hold button. So our ARPs, we got down, 
Up, down. Up and down. Random. But it doesn't have the ordered... It doesn't have the ordered... Um, way of playing apps where it'll follow the order in which you play which you put the notes in i guess it has a sequencer which i suppose is a bit like that but uh, i'd like to see that i'd like to see the ordered i'd like to see the ordered version of uh, you know app uh, how else could you call that ordered but you know essentially if i play let's just put it up if i go that note then that note then that note it doesn't matter which order i put notes in it'll flow that up down up and down random yeah so that's one thing i'd like to see um but that slightly confusing thing here holding the shift it, it there's very very little of that there are very very little uh, of that um just check, catching up with the, some of the comments there. Um, Steve Elvo's saying, yeah, there are patch names in the file names when using it for patch management. Yeah, that's a very good point. So if we connect it with USB to a computer, essentially you see it, it comes up as like a hard drive, really, and on your, on your desktop. And then you can see everything, you know, all the patches, also all the sequences. You can hold 16 sequences in the memory, I think, and also the single sample waveforms. You can do, you, you'll see all of that. So you can name your patches and, how you know, so if you're using it with a computer, you can use it, the librarian, name your patches and stuff. But obviously when you play in it, then you are at the mercy of this way of managing you know patch management so if i'm in patch mode for instance the black keys here refer to the banks and the white keys refer to the patches themselves within the banks so in bank a oh yeah and there's two lots there's two lots of banks as well solidly lit or flashing so each one of the you know so that doubles up uh, what's that so i get there's 128 patches storable on board uh, so I guess what you have to do is you have to kind of think, this is what I'm going to do. I've not got that far yet with it, but, you know, it may be like bank A, maybe pads, bank B, maybe bases, bank C, maybe leads and that sort of thing. And then I'll have eight of each. And yeah, so that kind of stuff. I've seen some people say, oh, it's a real shame there's no display on here. But I think in the most, I think that's a really, I think the lack of display is actually a really special thing about this. Um, uh, Martin uh, Rotaveria is asking, what type of filters does it have? It has a, it has a, what is it? An SSC filter? Am I right in that? It's something, that, it's a filter. Uh, it's not George's own filter, I think. I think that m it may be an off-the-shelf filter. Perhaps that's to do with the eco economics of having 12 of them in here. Uh, one for each voice uh yeah so i'm not entirely sure uh but but essentially it's a it's a low pass filter we can have a look at that in a moment um it's a low pass filter but there is a high pass filter and it has a few tricks up its sleeve um well namely the high pass filter is fixed at, i think 500 hertz so if i was to go and uh, make a, a play a, a Let's just hold this now, big fat chord. And then put the high pass filter in. It takes out a lot of the low end. Maybe that wasn't the best sound to use with it. But another thing that the filter has got though, it's got a, a tracking mode. If I put that in, then the high pass filter will track what the low pass filter is doing. So if I've got key track on there, then we have a sort of band pass filter then really, because the high pass moves in tandem with the, the low pass filter. Okay. Sorry, getting a bit jung, jung, all jumbled up here a little bit. But um, I was trying to avoid going through it because there are some great videos out there to uh, 
that that does explore it. Um, but there are a few little things that I'd like to show that uh, that I thought was quite interesting. And one of them is the difference between DDS1 and DDS2. So let me just go. I'm going to create our basic starting sound. Okay. Now, DDS1 has, as I mentioned, sign, saw, square, triangle, noise, and then the waveforms. DDS2 has sign, triangle, sorry, it's sign, sawtooth, square, triangle, noise. And then in place of the kind of the waveforms, it's actually got a, uh, a pulse wave that can be modulated. Um, DDS1 doesn't have a, 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 pulse, uh, a pulse wave. So you can't really do PWM on DDS1, but you can do this super DDS thing where, you know, it sort of gets into some, well, no, it's not the same, but they've done it deliberately to make these two have quite different characters. Now, where it gets interesting is that the waveforms uh, that DDS1 are based on, I think, are samples that are then up sampled to 2.6 megahertz. Uh, whereas DDS2's waveforms are algorithmically generated. I believe that's right. So they, so, well, I think the easiest way to show this, I think, is with the noise. Uh, so if I go, this is the noise of DDS1. And I'm going to pan across. So DDS2. It's brighter from DDS1. Slightly darker. Let's do it with the, the sawtooth. DDS1. Oh, sorry. Let's move DDS1 across. So, uh, sawtooth. DDS2. Sawtooth. It's pretty subtle, but the difference is there. Let's try it with a chord. One, two, one, two. So I think it's quite an interesting, subtle little thing there, but it means that the waveforms do have different qualities. Let's do that now with square wave. DDS1. DDS2. Yeah, it's curious. They are similar, but a bit different. DDS2. Yeah, it sounds more stereo, doesn't it? So I think that, that the way that the engine is working with them, maybe... Let's layer them both in the middle. Separate the LR phase, left and right phase. Yeah, it's a bit hard to tell, really. But um, but that is kind of an interesting. Um, that is quite an interesting blend between between the two. That the fact that they are different means that that is going to although quite subtly different uh it does mean that it that that the more you dive in and, and start building things those little differences uh oh steve elbows is saying dds1 uses a super binaural lfo more than a dds2 so those settings will affect this comparison yes very good point thank you very much uh and also Sonic Link is saying, what's it like without the binaural on? Very good point, actually. Let's let's turn binaural off. Make sure DDS is not enabled. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so that super wave only refers to DDS1. Yes, yeah, so that's a that's a point. I think it would it was off when we were doing this, but binaural was on. Uh let's have a look now. So let's just do that. You can hear them.
guess. So it's kind of... Yeah. Um, it's kind of... It's subtle, but the difference is there. Again, if I, you know, the, the, well, we can see what the triangle... Yeah, the triangle does sound a little bit different, actually, thinking about it. Oh, that's not triangle. That's harder. It's, yeah, it's hard to hear the difference there. DDS1. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, even more subtle. Uh, however, they do work slightly differently. So I'm guessing that, yeah, that maybe once you've got lots of modulations going, that their behaviors will start to, kind of, the differences will start to become a bit more apparent. Okay. Now, DDS2 as well can be put to different uses as well. So um, if we turn this knob all the way to the left, uh, essentially DDS2 becomes an LFO. And then that LFO, you know, can affect all, all manner of things. But when it's in this LFO mode, there's also a couple of other options that we've got. We can flick this switch up at the top. And that means that, uh, hey, thanks, Dice Stanton. Uh, <laughs> just cost me 2,200. In the words of the great Deke Leonard, we forgive, but we do not forget. Deke Leonard, the legend from the band Man. Oh, I've got... I've got Deke's autobiography, signed by the great man himself, sadly no longer with us. Uh, man, of course, Wales' is great, psychedelic, proggy kind of rock band. Uh, yeah, wow, nice, nice. Thanks, Di. <laughs> um, okay. Also, yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so the audio in essentially takes the... DDS2 signal path, I guess, and gets fed into the filters and the like. Um, and but I think it's only mono in, so I'm not entirely sure how how it uh, how that all works inside. But yeah, that's how it is. But it, the switch in the middle setting turns DDS2 into a sub oscillator, which is always handy to have. Uh, Especially when you've got these oscillators that are... Let's just enable the Super DDS, for instance, here. And now bring in that... Yeah. This synth sounds great. It sounds great. Because I'm working with that basic initial patch and done very little to it. And it just it's so rich and so fulfilling to play with. Um, I really think George has kind of... His vision, you know, this vision that he shared with me all those years ago, you know, seeing it kind of come to fruition, seeing going over and seeing him and just pl him playing with such a single monophonic voice wanting to get that right yeah good work it's got a heft it's got a weight to it it's got a majesty to it almost as well and it's also got a refined sort of sound to it this isn't a synth that you would necessarily turn to for you know filth <laughs> i think you'd turn to this more for love <laughs> the filth yeah, no, there's not a lot of filth that can be got on it, but we can see how filthy it will get. There are a few areas. Um, Peter O'Donovan, thank you so much. Super 6 is better. Is it better than the Arturia Polybrute? Great question. The Arturia Polybrute was very, that, you know, in a way that was the ultimate toss up between getting one of these and getting the, uh, the Polybrute. Little disclaimer. I bought this directly from George and he did give me a little bit of discount. Um, but I did pay a lot of money for it all the same. But I did get it for a little bit of discount and that was to acknowledge my involvement in it. Um, so thank you, George, for that. But I mean, it still did cost me quite a bit of money. So it's no freebie. Um, and I certainly was... Uh, 
I was certainly drawn between, you know, I think the Polybrute is really cool. But uh, interestingly, I was talking to the great Ty Unwin, a guest on my show, and I'm sure many of you know from Sonic State, and uh, um, he's got a Polybrute and he's also got the Super 6. And he said, look, it's hard to make the Super 6 sound bad, but it's quite easy to make the Polybrute sound bad. Or it's not necessarily that easy on a Polybrute to make it sound lovely, whereas the Super 6 typically sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> New Ninja saying, talking about filth, he wouldn't mind a 12-voice version of the Stylophone R8. Oh, my God. That thing. I mean, I've got the Stylophone R8 here, the Gen R8, and it is a filthy beast. It is the filthiest of filthy. So, yeah, a 12-voice <laughs> Stylophone would be amazing. Yeah, okay, I'm with you on that. <laughs> uh, but I was talking about filth and, and what available filth we have on board. Well, there is drive, and we'll look at, the, we'll look at that now because that does make a good difference. And there is also... And the envelope level, if we're driving, uh, let me just get rid of me. If we're driving the um, the VCA from envelope two, which I guess is all, is the default in a way, although we have got a couple of presets, I'll talk about them now. Uh, envelope two, envelope level, you can drive it a little bit. You've got about another 4 dB that you can kind of push it there doesn't necessarily lend it to uh to being filthy but it definitely adds a little bit more kind of drive uh wagyu is asking me what do i think about the eight voice abyss version 2 in development at dreadbox very good question now i'm not entirely sure i'm not entirely sure how out that new <laughs> i mean tom synth anatomy um is always hot there with the news um had shown that the dreadbox have got two poly synths in the making the nymph Ooh, which i think is a six voice and i think that's going to be along similar kind of design lines to the fabulous typhon and then the abyss version two now i've got the abyss version one which is a four voice and then the abyss version two is a eight voice with i think patch memories as well the abyss is there's no such luxuries the abyss is a very basic synth in a way i love it uh but the abyss i've i've used it on many episodes here you know is uh it's 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 appropriately named the abyss does take you down into those dark and dingy areas which is kind of nice you know it's nice but it certainly doesn't do this like kind of beautiful thing that the super six do, super six does and therein is something that is important for those naysayers and disbelievers out there non-believers whatever the word is you know yes different synthesizers they're all you know they bring so many well i suppose depending on which synths they are but you know, the synths have such personality and character, or certainly the ones that I seek are. Like mentioned, the Stylophone Gen R8 has bags of kind of character and it's nasty and it does all these horrible things. I say horrible, but horrible, good horrible, you know. <laughs> uh, and it does some horrible things, horrible, horrible things as well. But it does some really good, horrible, nasty stuff. But, you know, like my polys, you know, the, the Abyss and the... Um, and the the deep mind they couldn't be you know they're so different but the deep mind and the super six however there is a little crossover with those they're both obviously very sort of um uh, roland kind of based the um the deep mind of course being more juno i think um ah peter o'donovan thank you so much uh walled off iridium and super six good for retro synthwave yeah, I mean those two together, you'd have it, you'd have it all covered, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was just waffling there, but basically, since have, you know, good sense anyway. They have such distinct personality that you know you can justify having many of them. <laughs> Another analog poly that I've got that I really should mention more about really is the Electron Analog 4. I've actually got two. I've got a Mark 1 and a Mark 2. And uh those can be polychained. Actually, maybe I can polychain the two. Uh, but I mean you can you can use an analog four as a four voice polysynth, and that's got a completely different character again. Um 
Synths have feelings too, says uh, uh, Steve Elbows. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I was mentioning then. Anyway, let's come back to the Super 6. Uh, envelope. Um, yeah, you've got... You've got a... Um, like on the Rolands, you've got like a gate on off type envelope. Let me just get my, I'm just, I'm going to keep going back to this pre, this sort of initial sound, just so we've always got a starting point. Okay, so by default, yeah, I think actually by default it is. Oh. Yeah, I think by default, no, sorry, I'm going to do that again. Shift manual. Yeah, so it defaults to envelope two, but what we can do though is we can um, we can choose a gate on off, gate on off, much like a Roland's of the past, and uh, let me find my yeah let's let's go with that view for a bit. Um, but also, it's got uh, a gate, but with a bit of a release, I reckon, about... A Which, with it being a polysynth, makes sense. So it's nice. That means, then, envelope 2 is available, then, um, for other duties. Uh, so... You know, if 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 that if that envelope handles your amplitude needs, then it means you've got a spare envelope. So that's uh, that's kind of cool. But I'm going to go back to envelope two, actually, and we can see how snappy they are. Let's just ramp up that envelope level. And I would say, pretty snappy. Again, you know, this is working. The digital part of this is working at this super high rate. So the delay, for instance, you know, the, 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 that's like a digital delay, but is coming from the FGPA and um, means that Again, it's working at this super high rate. So that's really good. Audio rate modulation, all this kind of stuff, you know, works. It works, basically. Um, right, yeah. Release time. Quite long, but not infinite. I like infinite. I like, like on the abyss, for instance. Put the release to maximum, and then it will stay. Like it, it's it's like having uh, a sustain. But we've got the hold switch there, so I guess that makes sense. And actually, it's still going. So there is quite a lot of release time. Yeah. Um, envelope one does have a separate hold as well, which will delay the onset of the envelope. And it has everybody's favorite envelope feature, looping, a looping stage, which will loop around the AD um, part of the envelope. Um, yeah. So, you know, this is all fairly, fairly standard stuff. Uh, so if I was to kind of, you know, if I was to try and say what is the, you know, what are the unique things about this uh, synth? You know, what makes it stand out from other synths, you know? And, uh, you know, in the most, I would say the, the binaural approach, I think, is fabulous, you know, you, this beautiful, glorious stereo sound is always, you know... Thank you. 
Yeah, lovely. You know, so that beautiful, deep, rich sound is always just either there or moments away, you know. So it's... um. So that's one of the things I think really makes it stand out. That that beautiful, you know, it's a It's just... It's like pure, beautiful... And really pleasing. <laughs> so, yes, that's one of the things that makes it stand out. The other thing I think... Well, other things that makes it stand out... Yeah, build quality is... Yeah, it's built like an instrument that's designed to last a lifetime, really. And that's, uh, you know, that is something. Uh, Nav, Nav Cotel is saying it needs reverb. Well, it doesn't have reverb. That's a good point. It does have a uh, very Roland-esque uh, chorus. Juno-esque, really, I guess. One, two, and both together. Uh and it has a simple delay with just level time and feedback. But something that I haven't even touched on, though, is the mod matrix. You know, you've got lots of um, modulators around or, you know, or ways to, you know, in the DDS modulator, how much LFO1 is going to affect the pitch of, of, uh, of either DDS1, DDS2. Remember, I'm using DDS, the term, as the names of the oscillators. I think it's direct digital synthesis it stands for. Um, but anything that's kind of built in. Ah, Sonic Link's asking to see the bat wave in action. Yes, we'll do that in a moment. Very good point. That's something we talked about on Sonic State earlier. Um, but you have got this mod matrix here and written above along a line here. I might be able to, let's get a little bit of zoom action going on. Zoom in, zoom a zoom. Let's see if we can get in. Well, yes, so that row there is showing us destinations. And then, right, heave. <laughs> Here, this row is showing modulation sources so dds2 lfo2 envelope one velocity after touch pedal or cv input pitch bend minus pitch bend plus now those destinations are kind of suggested destinations but any any on screen uh, any any um whoop, um any control can be modulated by, and the way you do that, you'd, you'd hit the mod assign button, and then let's say we wanted LFO2 to modulate, uh, let's have a look, what should we have it modulate? Uh, cross mod, although cross mod is actually an available destination on here, but I just move it, and then I've created a, uh, I've created a mod link then. And then you use the control here for a bipolar approach to how much modulation that particular modulator is going to do. Now, I didn't want to touch too much on that because that almost it almost contradicts um, some of the underlying philosophy of what you see is what you get. Uh, because if you go in, if you start using that, then it makes that not so true because you can have an enormous amount of modulation going on that happens in the mod matrix. And you can kind of see what's going on when I when I hit the mod assign button, then I can see uh, if any anything that is lit up will tell me that, you know, will tell me which modulators are, have been put to use. 
and to which of the destinations of the written destinations are and then if i hit the button then i can see how much sorry if i go to the mod amount then i can see how much that mod amount is happening but that only applies to the ones that are written down here if i twiddle the control then it's not so easy to see so a little bit of an abstract layer there and that was something that i know george was really trying in the most to avoid however what's great about this synth is without going in to the mod assign there is um there is uh without going into the mod assign there is um plenty of modulation in that to make if you want to maintain that completely um uh i don't know a less abstract approach you can do it that way so i think it's good i think it i think it i think it kind of allows you to have that immediacy and then should you wish to delve further this mod matrix um this mod matrix lets you just keep going and going and going and uh i don't think there's any limit to how many modulation uh how many modulations um that you, that you can have going on right i'm going to go back to my basic sound okay and now let's create a patch from here i think now uh that's what i said i was going to do before let's do that now so first thing i want to do i want to slow my onset and have a nice long release let's get envelope let's get a filter being affected by envelope oh yeah i was going to talk about the drive we'll play with the drive now So we'll have um, typically, actually, I'm just going to take the envelope off for a minute. Typically, apply some resonance. And hey, Ty, on win. Add some resonance. We were talking about you earlier. All good. So if I had some resonance, there's that typical bass drop-off. However, if we apply a bit of drive, apply some resonance, a lot less bass roll-off there. And the drive, a bit like some of the other features, is just like a three-way thing off one or two so, so if I push the envelope level right up as well so you can see it doesn't particularly get that dirty Starting to get a lot of level now. So it's not a filthy beast. It's not a filthy beast. Fuzz war. Now, put any synth into the fuzz war, and that's from Death by Audio, uh, monophonic, but any synth into the fuzz war turns any synth, including, you know, a little Casio SK1, into a filthy beast. <laughs> um, still creamy with the resonance. Yeah, it is res with that drive. We, st we get, like... But take the drive off, and then you obviously get that kind of thinning that the resonance does. See it come in the, the low end there? Yeah. Now, 
Nice. But the cool thing with that drive then is it, 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 you kind of, it gives you almost like three filters in a way. That's on the one setting. And then on the, on the two setting. On the one setting. It's a bit more kind of perky in the one setting. And then off. So, yeah. For a relatively simple filter, you know, it gives you some decent options. And as I say, we can put in this fixed high pass filter or have it track. Put the key tracking on as well. In this kind of band pass. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep on building some sort of patch. I'm going to turn that off, the high pass for now. So I want to have a nice... Let's... I know. We've been very polyfocused. Let's go monophonic. I'm going to go into... Oops. Let's uh, come out of shift mode. And then um, into the solo mode. But I'm going to go into unison because unison has quite a few cool little things. Okay, so in unison, the shift button lets us pick between. This is unison. I think uh, three voices. Now this is six voice unison. So if I apply a little bit of LFO to the pitch. Let's just go on to oscillator one. I oh know I can have it. Let's have it. Let's have that. Let's have it doing both. Let's have it both. And now, if I hit this again, uh, we can have uh, octave unison. And then again, I think, as a fifth in there. And then one more gives us major. Well, let's take the let's take the uh, let's take the D tune off a moment. Yeah, so we can have a major... It would be quite nice, I think, if there was some way of choosing the chords. Or even better, to have some scale mode that will mean that we can just do one finger chords and it will keep everything nice in key. Uh, but you can't have everything. And again, one of the design... One of the overriding things about the design of this, I think, really does hark back to that early 80s Roland approach. And... Um, uh, yeah, so it doesn't stray too far from that. So, our oh, unison modes again then. Let's turn on our DDS now. And let's get that kind of doing things. Let's get our left to right phase separated. Hmm. Let's see how it let's let's turn it into a bass. Let's let's make a bass. Now I reckon unison one for this to start with. Let's drop it down. Okay. Let's have a fast attack. Let's have the filter then do. I think in for making a bass, so I think I'll I'll make oscillator two. I'll put it into sub oscillator mode. Wow, 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 wow,
make a base turn the dynamics off uh, what else to make a base sound fat just try it in solo Solo might actually sound nicer for bass, so that unison. It's a fatter sound of the unison, isn't it? Though? Mm, okay, now let me just try different voices of the unison. Yeah. Again. Andrew Brooks, good night. Sleep well. Again, simple tone, but eminently useful in production. A bit less release. Yeah, this kind of... Yeah, I mean, you know, not sort of an impressive sound in sort of uh in, in 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 you know in like a kind of wow factor but a really useful sound and again i mean i've mentioned this a number of times tonight you know i think that this is an eminently useful <laughs> instrument in music production you know it will work well with other instruments and um what I'm really looking forward to, to hearing is how well it'll work with a, a sort of more traditional rock band kind of setup, drums, bass, guitar, and, uh, and to see how that works. I want to use this with Asteroid Deluxe. Now, some people have mentioned I used to have the sledge on my, on my desktop behind me there, the big yellow sledge, um, which famously lost a key during a Sonic talk. <laughs> hmm, less said about that. But... The sledge died. The OS, nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with losing a key, but uh, just it had already done that once before. The OS just balked on it, and I don't know why. I sent it off, got it repaired. It's done the same thing again. And you know, when a piece of kit does something like that, any intention to use it live is it's just like no. I cannot trust it. I took it out to one rehearsal. The first time it went wrong, I took it to one rehearsal. So I don't know if the moving of it, I've got a proper case for it to move it in. Uh, I got it to the rehearsal and the, the display would, had gone blank on it. Um, got it fixed. And it's done the same thing again, sadly. It's a really, I, love the, I love the sledge. I think it's a really cool synth. Um, but... It's just sitting in uh, in my office, unloved and not working. Don't know what I'll do with it. I should really try and get it repaired. But that thing about taking that on the road in any way, no way. I'm sure there are plenty out there that are working fine. Maybe I've just been unlucky. But, uh, in, you know, as soon as a piece of kit proves itself to be unreliable, 
my interest. I fall out of love. I fall out of love with a piece of kit when it does something like that. And it would take a lot to make me uh, reconnect with it. Um, Bill Smith is asking me, how does the key bed feel? Uh, Fatah, yeah, it's a, it's the classic. Is it F? F oh, I can't remember the, the uh, FP9. Oh, I can't remember the actual, uh, which one it is, FP9 or something. Feels great. It's a lightweight, but quality one with quite a predictable kind of aftertouch. No problem with the keys on this at all. Yeah. So that's cool. So it's got... So I think this show tonight is called Why Did I Buy It? I've mentioned it already, but yes, I think build quality and practicality and just a glorious basic sound that can expand in numerous directions i've had i'll do one in a moment now i just get lost in this kind of uh i just get lost in it and i get lost in it in the most rewarding way uh so i think i might do something like that then now to uh just to kind of show you the sort of things quite like that bass sound simple but again it's i know that i know that that would work really well um so yeah yeah this is why i bought it and it's as i say it's in a prime place in my studio and you can see here i've got my waldorf kb37 and the moog semi-modulars there and i've been really loving that but now being able to when i'm facing when i'm working in that environment to then have this glorious polysynth that i can just reach and sort of play the contrast is fantastic and it is great i mean it's another nail in the coffin a little bit for me with soft synths it's another move away from soft synths uh i'm barely using soft synths now um and i think the arrival of this is going to uh you know further hasten the demise of my use of soft synths although spectrosonics if you're listening eric if you're listening I know he does occasionally tune in. Um, I think the Super 6 is a great contender for the hardware integration of Omnisphere. And that might, uh, that might indeed happen. So fingers crossed. Uh, fingers crossed. Wagoo, thank you. How about hold a chord down, guitar picks, and just play with the front panel to evolve the patch and explore. That's more or less exactly what I'm going to do. So let's do that now. <laughs> But rather than wedging the keys down, I've got a holder. HK, he's saying you can wear a cape and go classic. My goodness. Tune in next week. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you some of my capes. <laughs> I've actually, I'm putting together a new outfit. Oh, I'm too hemmed in now to reach. I've got some of my props, <laughs> my state well, some of my new stage gear. Uh, yes, I'm going to be playing gigs, ladies and gentlemen. I, they have been confirmed, or the ones that have been in. Uh, so I'm going to be playing a Green Man Festival, which is a fantastic festival that happens in um, Crickowl in Wales. Wonderful international festival. Um, and we've got a really great Friday night headline slot there with uh, the Charlotte Church late night pop dungeon. So anyone who's going to be at Green Man... Friday night, it's happening. Been confirmed. It's been, it's been in this TBC kind of for ages now, but uh, you know, based on kind of COVID rules. But that's happening. So um, one of the great things that I get to do with the Pop Dungeon is I get to wear the most outlandish outfits, and I'm always trying to out, outdo my previous outfits. And I think I'm on to a. I've got one coming. So yes, I love to wear capes. I love to wear ridiculous outfits. Um, I've actually just been wearing a tutu for something. <laughs> so yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I am not afraid to kind of uh, wear some pretty mad outfits. Yeah. So um, first gig we've got though is at Doon the Rabbit Hole. We're one of the headliners at that, which is great. Um, with Sleaford Mods and Dizzy Rascal and Teenage Fan Club and Earth, Wind and Fire, or some variant of Earth, Wind and Fire. And 10cc as well. So I'm uh, 
really excited about that one. That's going to be 15th of August. Green Man, I think we're playing on the 20th of August. And then there's a bunch of others which hopefully are going to happen. So, yeah, getting back out gigging. My goodness, I cannot wait. I tell you, I cannot wait. Um, <laughs> tutu. Um, Alice Bowie tribute. <laughs> Okay, Wagyu, I'm going to do as you said. So I'm going to get my, I'm going to go back to my starting sound and we're going to kind of get a little bit lost. Yeah, oh, uh, 10cc up in Scotland. Now we're going, we've got, we've got tour bus planned and all that kind of thing, but I don't think we'll get there in time and to see 10cc though, which they're one of my all time favourites. So hmm. anyway, let's do something. So I'm going to, Let's go. I'm going to play. Let's hold and I'm going to start this in a really simple way and you'll see the evolution as it goes. Uh, let's go here. Let's get DDS. Let's get the uh, Super DDS on now. Let's get our phase of our... Get a bit more interesting as we build this now. The chorus, we haven't really played with the chorus much. And delay. Key tracking. Filter drive. So I'm going to bring in a square wave from DDS2. sign Thank you. 
Collab. Wow, no, I've not seen it. Three fantastic artists. <laughs> not the most musical. subdivisions of the clock but the rate of LFO1 is also synced to the clock DDS2, leave that in the middle. I'm going to put it into this crossfade mode now. So, so the low notes then. So if I make a sine wave in the top. And then what happens then? It'll crossfade. Let's get that into like a sawtooth in the left, like in a lower octave. Set the split point here with a mix. It's maybe a bit too dark there. Drop the feedback down a little. So my tempo control now is changing the delay and LFO one simultaneously. Thank you. 
Let's see if we can get it back to swing nice again. <laughs> Let's just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go mad. I'm gonna go mad. Let's just go mad. Oh, of course, it's got poor polyphonic portamento, which is quite fun. Actually, let's just do that. <laughs> this is getting a bit of lost this patch, so let's go back. So quick to get back to here. That, you see, that's another thing. But look, polyphonic portamento is always an interesting thing. Let's just make this sound a little bit nicer. Chorus one. Chorus two. Chorus three. Long releases. <laughs> it's a really long one now. Find sound is so is always is always there. Whoops. Yeah. So, you know, fun, immediate, direct, beautiful. It's a winner, I think. So I think I'm going to probably, I'm going to probably call time now. I'm getting a bit uh, hot and bothered up here in my attic. Mm -mm. These things are great, you know, especially that. There's three ways to stop this from tilt tipping out over your gear. That. There's a little lock switch, like a safety catch, and then a trigger. So when you're not doing it, no trigger. As soon as you let go of the trigger, hooray! <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> really important though, isn't it? Liquid in your studio is deadly. Uh, where's our jam? Rock out stream. We, yeah, we could do like we could do something. We'll definitely. Oh yeah, bat wave. I said I'll do a bat wave. Let's do a bat wave. So let's go back to our. So basically, DDS one. If we were to pick. Whichever waveform, and again, these are single sample waveforms. Let's take that one. And what we'll do is, I'm holding down shift and then picking a waveform with shift on now. Now, our that waveform is going to be the waveform that LFO1 uses. So let's... Uh, Yeah, one wave form here. And I think if 
if I move away from here. Oh no, I think that. So actually, let's. <laughs> I haven't really played with this. I, uh, this is something I've been meaning to do. So uh, I'll have uh, I'll have LFO modulate DDS2. I'll put the mix over to DDS2, and I'll choose a sawtooth. So now on here. Am I doing this right? Let me just do that again. Shift, change, waveform. Ah, aha. This. Oh no, hang on. Shift, waveform. Are these actually doing it? <laughs> I might be, I might be getting that wrong. I don't know if I need to, I don't know if I need to do shift and LFO every time I change the waveform. Hang on, let's have a look. Shift, change the waveform, and then... I think I'll come back to that one. I'll try and uh, <laughs> the bat wave modification. I, I, I haven't actually tried it, uh, so I, I probably should investigate that. Or oh, was it LFO2? It, no, no, it was LFO1. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, um, I just need to kind of figure that out a little bit more. Um, <laughs> uh Sam saying this is the point his wife comes in and tells him to turn his synth down. Yeah, apologies. I mean, my God, some of the horrible noises I make on my show. I really fear that uh, I've upset many a, many a spouse. <laughs> All right, let's have a little jam out then. So I'm going to finish now. Thank you, everyone, ever so much for joining me. We've had a, a bumper crop of people in watching tonight. It's been lovely. Thank you ever so much. Um, my intention is to be back every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Now, for those of you who follow my Adventures in Eurorack show, now that show is currently on ice, but will be back. The reason it's on ice is because I'm working on some tracks in the modular tracks. And, um, and I realised that my show was actually preventing me from making proper progress, really, because I was always having to change things around to try and make the show uh interesting but um what i want to do is when i bring my eurorack show back is actually i want to kind of show what i've been doing and i'm working on a track for an album um that i'm really pleased to be involved in and uh i'd like to kind of demonstrate what i've done and that's partly because i've been trying to chronicle my journey from you know a total noob in eurorack to a a noob <laughs> um but actually making some progress and i really owe it to people who've been following that show to kind of show where i've got to now because i've been making music hooray stuff that sounds like music and that's that's the thing i've been really on that particular show trying to you know find my way into making something that is good <laughs> ultimately rather than just uh noise i mean that's the thing with modular it's so much fun just to make just noise uh and then to actually shape that noise into something that's you know got some emotional value as well i think um but yeah so 
So uh, I'll probably announce on my Wednesday show when I plan to bring that show back. I hope maybe maybe September time, perhaps. Um, although I've got quite a few gigs in September too. But yeah, we'll see about that. But, um, but I certainly want to try and keep my Wednesday show going. I know that in August I've got a bunch of rehearsals as well, which probably might knock out some shows. But I'm going to try anyway, at least, to kind of come back at 8pm. Uh, where are we? BST, UK, British summertime, UK time. Um for future and uh, and also have little highlight shows as well that's something and i am working on a best of uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so i've asked before if anyone does remember any of the, my previous shows where there's anything that they, that they think should be included in a best of then please comment uh, maybe on, on that actual show itself and i'll find the comments and that'll help me try and put together something um just to kind of capture some of the best moments and thank you everybody who has stood by me you know and i've been away for a while but i'm intend to come back and so it's really nice to come back to a really nice um a nice warm reception <laughs> okay right so i'm going to sign off now and I, i'm going to do a play out so bye for now and see you on the other side Thank you.
<laughs> it's time to say goodbye, everybody. <laughs> keep hitting that wrong button there <laughs> uh okay yeah so so jam there but i mean i've been having lots of fun anyway i did say this was a way of saying goodbye and that is thank you everyone catch you soon bye bye